Let's take our Bibles, go to Acts chapter 21, and um, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless our time. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to our, our church, our country. Thank you, Lord, for the election that took place. So, so thankful Donald Trump's in the White House. And uh, we pray you bless that. We pray for his protection. And Lord, I uh, pray that he be surrounded by good men and women. And Father, you bless that uh, administration. And Father, we thank you also for our church. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, prisoners to preach. And uh, Father, we pray that you bless that tonight and help us to understand chapter 21. We pray that you'd speak to our hearts and we pray you be glorified in our response. We thank you so much for all your blessings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So notice chapter 21. We'll pick up here in verse 15. And after those days, he took up our carriages and went to Jerusalem. And there went with us also certain of disciples Caesarea and brought with them one, a man son of uh, Cyprus and an old disciple with whom he should lodge. And when he had uh, were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Thank you. you may be seated. So this is a, a interesting chapter. It's a kind of a bridge chapter between chapter 20 and 22. And uh, there's just a lot of information here. But one thing, the Apostle Paul, uh, he was a great Christian and a great man of character. So let's take our Bible go to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And notice, if you would, verse 10. And the Bible says, and notice chapter 10 of 2 Timothy, uh, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, uh, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and at Iconium, at, at Lystra, and what persecution I endured. But out of uh, all them, all the Lord delivered, out of them all the Lord delivered me. And uh, yea, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution, uh, live godly in Christ Jesus suffer persecution. So Paul states here in verse 10 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first thing he says is doctrine. He said, I, I have a doctrine. And uh, that's important because it tells us that Paul uh, really uh, uh, was concerned about what he believed and what he practiced. And uh, we all know to say, you know, what, what doctrine do you believe in? I was uh, speaking to someone recently, and they, I, I said, well, it's Protestant doctrine. And there's a difference between Protestant and Baptist and Catholicism and all the different doctrines in the world. And we're a Bible-believing people. I don't say that just to say it. I mean it with all my heart. Amen. The Bible says it, we believe it. Amen. And I'm not ashamed of any verse of Scripture in the Bible. I believe in Genesis 1, 1 to uh, Revelation 22, 21. So uh, Paul speaks here the doctrine and what we believe, his purpose, his faith, his long-suffering, his charity, his patience. Verse 11, he speaks of his persecution, the affliction. And, but he says, I endure it. And, uh, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Verse 12, Paul was a man with an unwavering God confidence. And that's where we should be. We should have God confidence. We should say, Lord, I, you know, you know I, I believe what your word says, and I'm going to live by it. I'm going I'm to take my stand. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to compromise. And uh, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit boldness, and determination to live and carry out the Great Commission. So Paul displayed a great resolve to do the will of God. And uh, it, it, when you think about it, he inspired others to go to the region beyond. So Paul spoke about the regions beyond in 2 Corinthians, and he provoked others to live godly lives. Paul was a man determined to plant New Testament churches throughout the world, 
Take your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 15, please. Romans 15. And um, and we'll notice verse 20. That we come to 15. And verse 20 uh, speaks here of... Um, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, unless I should build upon another man's foundation. So Paul was very evangelistic. He wanted to get the gospel out. Paul was Christ-like. Paul had the mind of Christ. And he even encouraged us to have the, let this mind dwell in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Paul walked humbly. And then Paul was gracious kind and thoughtful. So back here in our text, Acts 21, verse 15 and 16, he said, after those days we took up our carriages, went up to Jerusalem, and there went with us also certain disciples of Caesarea and brought with them uh, one uh, mason of Cyprus, an old disciple, which would, uh, whom uh, we uh, should uh, lodge. I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, uh, we read about the last stop in Paul's missionary journey, and he was going to stop at Caesarea uh, uh, before Jerusalem. And here they stayed with an old disciple, a man named Mason, who was of Cyprus, a Hellenistic Jew. Verse 17, and when we were come to her Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And Paul and his team arrived in Jerusalem. One main reason for Paul coming to Jerusalem was to deliver an offering to help the church and relieve the suffering saints at the church. And the end, and this is the end of Paul's third missionary journey. So the first thing we see tonight is the communion. Verse 17, if you would. And when we come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us glad, gladly. And that the day following, Paul went in uh, uh, with uh, us into James and all the other elders were present and when he had saluted them he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry and that's a great thing when you think about a, a missionary coming back from the field and he reports you know we just had that last week with Nathaniel and all the different works are going on in Bangladesh it was wonderful and uh, so it, it's always good to hear uh, guys give reports. And the apostle most likely arrived in the day, time for the day of Pentecost. Uh, and then the brethren were grateful by the generosity of the Gentile churches. And they were very generous and kind and met the need in the church of Jerusalem. And the last time Paul was at Jerusalem was at the end of the third, uh, second missionary journey, about 54 A.D., and then in Acts 21 and verse 17, the Bible said, when he was come to Jerusalem, the brethren received him gladly. So they were, they were a, a, a very open and honest. And I have to tell you, our testimony as a church is we are very receptive to missionaries who come by, special speakers who come preach for us. Very receptive. And that speaks volumes of the spirituality of our church. And the brethren received Paul gladly, the leadership of the church at Jerusalem. James, the half-brother of, of the Lord, was the pastor, verse 18. And when the day followed, Paul went in unto, uh, with us unto James, and all the elders were present. So Paul reports to the church uh, and the ministry among the Gentiles, verse 19, and when he was, had saluted them, he departed, uh, he declared publicly that things uh, God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So, and you think about what things were wrought. This should have been his testimony of his life, of, of, of the, the family, the church, uh, our prayer lives. We ought to be speaking uh, and saying what God has done for us as he, what, he, what he's wrought in our lives. And we all ought to have a good testimony, amen, how God is working. And we trust the Lord, we look to the Lord to work in our lives. And that should not be something that once in a blue mooner, 
It should be done regularly. God's working. I had a chance to witness someone. I had a chance to pass that track. I had a chance to, you know, take a stand. I had a chance to defend the faith, whatever it may be. And the attitude of giving all glory to God for all he has done all, will all continue to uh, do for us and through us. So the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 29, that no flesh of glory in his presence. And that's one thing that God God's, guards against is people glorifying themselves. <laughs> that's not, there's no place for that in our lives. You know, I, I, I quoted uh, one time uh, Charles Spurgeon where uh, someone had said something about a person, and, he, and Charles Spurgeon said, well, it's a good thing, you know, they didn't spill all the beans because, you know, we're not worth, uh, you know, anything before the Lord. Now, God loves us. He gives his life for us, but we're worse than what we claim to be. Right. Isn't that right? right. And so, uh, you know, God's not going to share uh, his glory uh, with anyone else. So take your Bibles now and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we pick it up here in verse 5. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. And the Bible says in verse 5, Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you baptized, believed, even uh, as the Lord gave to every man? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so that neither is he that planted anything, uh, and, and, he, uh, thing, and, and neither... Uh, be uh, in that water, but God that give the increase. So again, it's it's not what I do or you do. It's God. He, he, you know, someone gets saved is to God's glory. It's not our glory, but to God. And so notice, if you would, verse chapter four and verse six, and the Bible says, and, and these things, brethren, I have uh, have in a figure transferred to myself and to Paulus, and to your sakes, that you might learn uh, in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for uh, one against another. And then we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll continue with this line of thinking, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and notice if you would, um, Verse 21. And the Bible says in verse 21, aha, there's no. If you have it in your Bible, please let me know what it says. <laughs> you have more re revelation than I have. Let's try 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21. Here we go. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord. And the cup of devils, you cannot be partaking of the Lord's side, uh, Lord's table, and the table of devils. Do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are, 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 are we stronger than he? So God is very careful about what he says and does. Then notice verse 17, if you would. Verse 17, but uh, we being many are one bread and one body, for he, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they uh, which eat of the sacrifice, partake of the altar? So Paul is making a comparison here that, you know, uh, we should not glorify ourselves or promote ourselves. You know, it's God that it gives us the ability to believe and trust. It's God's word that brings us to Christ. It's Jesus who saves us. It's all of God. Amen. And so we're not to glory in these things, but we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Let's turn back to our text, please. Chapter 21 and verse 20. And the Bible says, uh, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, bro brother, uh, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they all uh, they are all zealous of the law. 
So the rejoicing over God's work, and we would be quick to rejoice in the work of God in our lives and the lives of others. So, you know, I, I praise the Lord for what God has done as we prayed for our elections. And I have to tell you, if you watched it, I know a lot of you guys were up all night, and I appreciate that, but that was a miracle that took place last night. And one reason was that the, there was such a sweep that the, the Democrats couldn't cheat. That's what, that's what they did last time. And, uh, you know, they took days for them to count all the ballots. It was crazy. But anyway, praise the Lord, that was a miracle. Amen. And then uh, number two, we see the concern, uh, verse uh, 21, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither walk after the custom. What, what is it there for? The multitude much needs come together, uh, for they will hear that thou art come. So uh, the Bible teaches a concern. And after Paul testifies uh, in all that God had done among the Gentiles through his travels, the elders of the church in Jerusalem reminded Paul of the thousands of Jewish believers who were converted and, and zealous of the law. And we just read that verse 20, 21. This was a transitional time. And Judaism thought law-keeping and circumcision were part of salvation. They, they, there's, uh, those who deceive the churches of Galatia, and uh, they've been called the Judaizers. Now the rumor had circulated Paul rejected teaching of the person of Moses and the pastors and leaders of the church in Jerusalem wanted to hear what Paul, uh, if Paul, uh, this was true, what Paul said in those verse 22. Uh, he said, what is it there for? The multitude must needs come together for they will hear uh, that thou art come. So that brings us to the third point, the ceremony, verse 23, do therefore this they that are uh, say uh, to thee, we have four men which have vowed on them, th them uh, take and purify them thyself with them and be at charge with them uh, that they may shave all their heads and, uh, and, uh, and all may know that thou uh, that those things whereof they were informed concern thee uh, are nothing, but that thou dost thyself also walketh orderly in keeping the law. And touching the Gentiles which believe, we have no written and concluded that they observe no such thing, uh, save only they keep themselves from uh, things off to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. And, and the Bible teaches that this is what God told the Gentiles that they were to abstain from. The Gentiles were not, not to be partakers of the dietary law, the, the, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, that, that whole teaching was false. And uh, verse 24 and 25 clearly teach this, and Paul's defiling act was uh, in his association with the Gentiles. Those verse 28 and 29. And the Bible says, crying out, men of Israel, help, that uh, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and the place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and had polluted this holy place. Verse 29, for they had seen before uh, with him in the city of Trophimus and Ephesians, uh, whom they, they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So there's a lot of problems here, but Paul seemed to straighten it out. Paul had paid the cost of the required offering, and to many this was the troubling that Paul had responded this way. Now a couple of thoughts here. Number one, Paul uh, loved his countrymen. There's no doubt. He said in chapter 10, he said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He loved them. 
And even though they were hypocritical Pharisees and, you know, self-righteous Jews, he loved them. And uh, he did not want a split between the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, converts to the church of Jerusalem. So Paul was very careful of that. He didn't want to cause any division. Second of all, Paul was one of the opposers to the doctrine of Judaizers. And let's go to, if you would, Galatians chapter 1, please. Let's turn there quickly. Galatians chapter 1. And notice verse 6. And the Bible says in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, Paul is saying that they were believing another gospel, which uh, is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But uh, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have, res uh, have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And uh, uh, I'll tell you what that means when he said, let him be accursed, and let him be damned to hell. That's how Paul protected the gospel. He was dead serious about it. And again, people should not pervert the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and the third day he rose again. That's it. That's the gospel. And you add baptism to it, or foot washing, or back scratching, or whatever the thing is, it's not good. You, you leave the gospel alone. It's a death, burial, and resurrection, and people who believe on that and repent, they'll be born again. Amen. Now notice he says in verse 9, as they said before, to say, I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Or for, uh, if I yet please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. So Paul writes to the churches of Galatians, trying to straighten this out. And then Paul challenged Peter for separating from the Gentile believers. Notice Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. And the Bible says in verse 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before this certain uh, came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which uh, were in the, uh, uh, of the circumcision. And verse 13, uh, and the other Jews assembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas also carried away with their uh, dissimulation. So Peter was, uh, had a fear of man, uh, and uh, that's why he was hypocritical at that point. And Paul rebuked him to his face and said, this is not right. You know, you were going to be faithful to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And uh, I don't know if he brought that uh, time that Peter had that dream uh, when he was at Joppa, but that would be interesting. And Paul is not accused of his hypocrisy. Later, Paul would declare he had a clear conscience in this matter. So we see the communion, the concern, the ceremony, the custody. The custody. In verse 27, if you would, uh, let's pick it up there. When the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, uh, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stood up the people and laid hands on him and crying out, men in Israel, help. And this is him that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and the place and the further broad Greeks in the temple and that pointed to the holy place. Well, this is not true. And uh, the year is 58 AD, four years after the second missionary journey and possibly early summer, and there were more than a million Jews at Jerusalem. And verse 27, Paul recognized the Jews from Jerusalem. And uh, they were from Ephesus. Excuse me. And then uh, notice their false accusation. So verse 28 says, um, 
We read that in verse 29, uh, for they had seen before him in the city of Trophimus and Ephesians, whom they supported, supposed that Paul had bought, brought into the temple. But that was, that was assuming. And let me tell you this, beloved, and I mean this with all my heart. Don't be a person who speculates. Spec speculation caused people a lot of problems. Well, I thought that's what you, I thought. Did you know? No. You speculated. And speculating caused you a lot of problems. You don't talk to people. You back off from them because you thought. Well, sometimes your thinking is wrong. Right? We have to think right. So, notice, if you would, verse 31, and when they went about to kill him, think about this, it was leading lead them to kill Paul. Tidings ca uh, came among the chief captain of, of the band and all Jerusalem was in uproar and immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down uh, unto them. And when they saw the chief captain, captain he is, uh, and the soldiers, they left beating Paul. So the commotion caused a problem in the temple, uh, and the, the, the Jews were on their way to beating Paul to death, and the Roman soldiers saved his life, all because of speculation, all because of what you thought, you assumed. A lot of problems come out of that. So we don't want to speculate. Just the facts. Give me the facts. Right? Verse 23, the Bible says, uh, let me see here. Verse 33, I'm sorry. Uh, and, but the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound uh, with two chains and I, de I de demanded who it was that, uh, and what he had done. And some cried one thing, another uh, uh, other among the multitude, and when they uh, could not know the certainty of the tumult, he uh, commanded him to be carried into the castle. And uh, the Bible tells us Paul's placed in shackles, Paul is taken into custody, and he was literally picked up and carried up the stairs of the castle, and this castle was a fortress uh, for the garrison. So in the verse 35, and when he was uh, come upon the stairs, so it was when he was born of the soldiers by the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying away, away with him. So the, the Jews were very emotional. And, uh, you know, that's okay. But they are as a people. It really is the, the Middle East people. You know, you ever seen on, on TV, if someone's killed, they can, and crowds of people are there, and they're chanting, and they're all upset, and they, they probably don't know what they're upset about it. That's not someone died, and they, they're not really right about what happened, and so on. Again, they, they're accusing people falsely, and all this, and it's because people are many times emotionally unsound. So pick up here in verse 37, and the captain did not know Paul spoke Greek, but he proved Paul was educated as Paul was led to the castle. He said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee? Uh, and who said, can thou speak Greek? Now, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying maybe it's late on Wednesday night and but if I'm talking in Greek, if I spoke to you in Spanish, I may not know a lot, maybe a little buquito, but you know, I'm going to speak Spanish to you. What a ding ding. Anyway, verse 38, please. And, and, not, and, and art thou not an Egyptian? Would before. Uh, these days made us up, uh, made an uproar, and led us out unto the wilderness. Four thousand men that were uh, murderers. Now, talk about speculation. 
You have Paul, who's a Jew, an Egyptian, and he's taken 4,000 men into the wilderness, and they're all murderers. <laughs> what is going on? But see, these are, these are lies that the devil tells. I mean, to me, it's crazy that they have such thoughts. Aren't you the Egyptian? Aren't you the one that led those 4,000 men into the wilderness, and they're all murderers? Who they murder? But see, this is what happens when emotions run high. Speculation. False accusation. So uh, I'm just telling you what I do, and we're almost done. When I hear there's a problem, I hear from the person who supposedly committed the problem, I hear from other witnesses. And then I put my thinking up on, make believe, and uh, I decide what to, I'm going to do. But I'm not going to speculate. That stuff is, is too foreign to me. And it's so important that we act on facts, Amen. not on feelings. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, verse 38, uh, are there Egyptian that's mistaken identity? And then verse 39, but Paul said, I'm a man, once I'm a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So Paul has identified himself as a Jew, and he, had, he has yet to identify himself as a Roman citizen. But it's coming. In verse 40, and Paul prepared himself to address his countrymen and uh, what, what seemed to be an evil situation. So notice that when he was given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when they were made great, when there was made great silence, he spake in them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and that leads us to chapter. 22, and Paul, God turned around for good, the gospel was preached. So, you know, I have to tell you something. We're not there right now, but if this would take place, just remember, God is on your side. He, he's, he's for us. He's not against us. And uh, it may seem that the world's against us. Maybe they are. But God's for us. And so Paul was a person all by himself, uh, he was falsely accused. You're an Egyptian that killed, had 4,000 men that killed people. So far for the truth. Mistaken identity. Yet God stood by Paul, and you can see it here, may not state this, but you see how God turned the whole thing around. All right? And that ends chapter 21. Let's uh, stand to our feet, please, and uh, thank the Lord for this time. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your goodness to us and thank you for this chapter and, and uh, thank you, Lord, for the uh, other chapters coming up. We pray you bless the book of Acts, our study, and help us to see the importance of not speculating, not saying things that we don't know is true. And it can cause a lot of problems in people's life. Paul, Paul is being beaten to death because of speculation. And Father, and again we see if, if Paul is, is, is serving you, Lord, he's not by himself. God's going to stand with him. And it's so important that we have the leadership of the Lord in our lives and, and do your will. I pray you bless your people tonight. Thank you for them. Bless this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads about.